I ask you to open up your Bibles, please, to John chapter 10, the Gospel of John chapter 10, and we're going to continue tonight in a series we began two weeks ago entitled, The Lord is My Shepherd, and I think that if the Lord will help me tonight when you leave, you'll love him even more. You'll love him even more. Because coming to church, coming to service is not all about being religious. It's not all about doing good things or carrying on with righteous activity. But it's coming to know, coming to know who God is and what he's done for us so that our faith can stand in the power of God. And when you really see Jesus, I said when you really see Jesus... When you really see Jesus and understand who he is and what he's done for you, you'll love him even more. The Lord is my shepherd. Tonight, I'd like you to follow with me, and we'll start off with these verses in chapter 10, simply 11 and 12, but they will be our beginning point, and we'll digress for a moment or two and go back and Uh, review some of the things that we've said in the last message, in the introductory message. But read this with me, if you would, John chapter 10, verse 11. The Lord Jesus declaring this about himself. I am the good shepherd. The Lord Jesus declaring to the Jews of his day, Israelites of his day, and all of humanity today, I am. The good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. It's definitive. It marks a line in the sand. It makes a statement that he is unique. That there is none like him. That there will never be another like him. That he was planned to be different and unique and special from the foundation of the earth. And he proclaims it to his people in that hour. I am the good shepherd. And he proclaims it to us tonight. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. We want to preach the Lord is my shepherd Part two, pray with me if you would. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you tonight in the name of that precious name of Jesus. And Father, I'm asking you now to anoint me with the Holy Spirit to bring bread to your people, to bring life to your people through the preached word of the Lord. And Father, cause every heart to be receptive by the entrance and the work of the Holy Spirit that they might receive exactly what they have need of tonight, and God will give you the praise, and will give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, and amen. Two weeks ago, I took as a text probably one of the most familiar passages of Scripture known to the church, and in reality, probably known to the human race, even by those who don't necessarily... Uh, embrace Christ as their Savior, Psalm 23 is widely known, used. You'll find it on placards, on posters, on books, and proclamations of almost all Christian religious activity. But not all Christian religious activity actually understands in personal experience what Psalm 23 states. And I spent the majority of our time two weeks ago on the first statement, the two clauses in the first verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my personal shepherd. And I shall not want. And God, through David, was not just making a declaration of who he was to David, even though it was true in the time of David's trials and in the time of David's heartache and in the time of David's 
running from Saul in the time of David's bruisings and in the time of David's joy, David had experienced the Lord as his shepherd. And so he would pen the words. But you must understand that the Psalms are not just, are not just lyric set to music for worship of past experiences, but the Psalms are prophetic. They are prophetic. They're not just declaring what used to be and what was for David. But in fact, God was declaring in Psalm 23 what he intended for each and every one who would come to him by faith and receive his plan of redemption. Through the psalmist then, David is saying, the Lord will be your shepherd. Hallelujah. God is going to raise up a shepherd. And when he comes, you'll not want There'll not be one need that he won't be able to meet. There'll not be one time when he won't take you to clear pasture and take you to clear water and walk through the valley of the shadow of death with you and anoint you in the midst of your enemies. God was promising through David that I'm going to send a shepherd. He's not here yet, but prophetically, the Lord will be your shepherd. And when he comes, he's not going to cause you to lack He's going to cause you to prosper. He's not going to cause you to be destroyed. He's going to cause you to experience life as I intended it. I know the thing's in a mess. I know the world is in chaos. I know that there's problems on every hand. But God said through David, I have a solution. I will send a shepherd. And when he gets there, the Lord will set up a covenant. And he will be my shepherd. And I shall not want hallelujah hallelujah the lord then wants to be your personal shepherd not just david's shepherd not just the pastor's shepherd but the lord the covenant god of all the earth the god who makes covenant desires to be Your shepherd, your personal shepherd. Personal shepherd. And so that was the first aspect of the Lord is my shepherd. He's your personal shepherd. I made the point and I stress it again tonight. If you indeed have a shepherd, that means that you are sheep. That means you can't find your way home. That means you can't find your way to pasture. That means you can't find where the clear, smooth waters are that you may drink. That means that you are totally dependent upon the shepherd that God would send to become the one who would lead you, mind you. He wants to lead you. God gave you a shepherd to lead you. To walk, come on, somebody, help me tonight. He wants to lead you. The shepherd goes before the sheep. He doesn't drive them. He wants to lead you. And so if you have a personal shepherd, you have to see yourself as sheep and recognize your need for the shepherd. And as I mentioned last time, two weeks ago, the sheep is a unique animal. It can't find its way home. The dog will find its way home. The cat will find its way home. The goat will find its way home. But the sheep's going to end up four blocks away, heading the wrong direction, and not being able to find himself turning around. Because sheep are dumb. I said sheep are dumb. I said sheep are incapable of protecting themselves. They have no protection. What are they going to fight with? Wool you to death? They've got to have a shepherd. They've got to have a shepherd. They've got to have a shepherd. And God's promise, you will have a shepherd. Yes, yes, yes. And not only that, the covenant God, creator of heaven and earth and sea and sky and all that in them is, he will be my personal shepherd and I shall not want. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So God through David promised a personal shepherd to the sheep. 
the sheep of Israel. And throughout the ages, the prophets would proclaim and reannounce God's intention of sending this shepherd who would meet every need. In Psalm chapter 80 and verse 1, the Bible declaring God is our shepherd says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. So God is going to be the shepherd. The shepherd will be God. In Isaiah chapter 40, 10 through 11, the Bible again declares he's sending a shepherd. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. God promised a shepherd. And finally in Ezekiel 34 and verse 23, he proclaims, I will set up one shepherd over them. And he shall feed them, even my servant David. And he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. So the scripture is replete that there would one day come a shepherd, a unique one. And that unique one would not just be a man, but it would be, in fact, God. The one who dwells between the cherubims, the one who controls all things, the one who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think, he would send a shepherd. Now to John, chapter 10 and verse 11, Jesus steps on the scene and he says, fellas, <laughs> I, I am, I am the good shepherd. I am the noble one, the unique one, God who would come to shepherd you. You don't have to wait for me any longer. I am, I am. Now, you know, we have a problem sometimes in Christianity and I'll use the setting to explain the problem. And I hope to forever dissuade you from thinking wrongly again as you leave this place tonight. And that's this. Jesus boldly proclaimed and announced exactly who he was. You've got to understand in Jesus' life there were really three major time frames there was a year, if you will, of introduction where he was introduced to the masses and they began to know his name. And in his, in his popularity that first year, he actually blossomed into a year of distinct popularity where he became the, the name that was mouthed among the masses. He was the one people talked about over the dinner table. The action of this Nazarene, this Galilean, this miracle worker was the talk of the area, the talk of the nation, and the talk spread throughout all of Israel and all of Asia, and people by the thousands would flock to this most popular man in his second year of ministry as he miracle after miracle was worked through his hand and blessing after blessing was given to the people. But God never just gives blessing for blessing's sake. His plan was that by allowing Christ, allowing Jesus... To operate in the miracle power that he did, it would in fact validate that which he proclaimed he was. And when the people began to hear what Jesus had to say about himself, they began to grow angry. Oh, they wanted the blessing. 
but they didn't want to listen and be associated with someone who stood up boldly and said, I want you to know I'm God. We say, oh, Jesus didn't say that. Oh, yes, he did. He proclaimed it. Let me tell you, the second and third year of his ministry, he came to present himself as king, as shepherd, as savior to the nation of Israel. The miracles were not supposed to be the emphasis, but the miracles should have been recognized as the the evidence, as the truth, as the proof that what he spoke out of his mouth was being validated by the heavenly father. Don't you ever let anybody tell you that Jesus, while he was here on this earth, earth did not continuously proclaim that he was God and the son of God. Yes, yes. We make a huge mistake When we say, oh, Jesus never clearly proclaimed himself as the one God would send. Oh, yes, he did. And when he began to do it, the multitudes began to melt away. Oh, I want my blessing, but, you know, to accept you, a mere man, as God, and to have that demanded of me, that would make me a fanatic. And I surely don't want to be ousted from a lot of the religious leadership which doesn't quite seem to agree with that which you are proclaiming. Surely, if He's God, I would have to operate in faith towards Him more. In other words, more than just a teacher. More than just a rabbi. More than just a good man, which is what the religions of the world attempt to try to tell you, the believer, that Jesus proclaimed himself as. I'm here to tell you tonight, and I'm going to give you the evidence, Jesus proclaimed himself clearly as the Son of God without mistake, sometimes publicly, sometimes to heathen, sometimes to his disciples, but he proclaimed it. And in fact, this book of John is written unlike the synoptics, because in it is contained the confessions of the Lord Jesus Christ, the professions of the Lord Jesus Christ as to how he declared who he was and what he came to do. John said in John chapter 20, I believe it's verse 31, that these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And his third year of ministry begins... And with it comes the opposition. I have to say that in many ways, at many times, your life as a believer will mirror in a microcosm over and over again the three years of Jesus' life. There'll be a time of inauguration, followed by a time of blessing, followed by a time of trial. You know what that trial is going to do? It's going to solidify that which you received or eliminate it. God, for instance, will plant a word in your heart. And it will, in fact, cause great joy. And you'll begin to operate in that word. And it'll begin to move in you and change you and alter you, whatever that word will be. So you are inaugurated and you're blessed. But if you don't think the devil's going to come to test it, you're sadly mistaken. Because every word that he gives you, every blessing that he gives you, Satan will come to try to steal it. And you will over and over and over and over again go through that little microcosm, that little picture of Jesus' life, a time of inauguration. A time of blessing, a time of testing or trial or opposition. But the good news is he'll bring you through it. He'll bring you through it. He'll bring you through it. Hallelujah. Don't don't consider it a strange thing when you experience a fiery trial right after you received a blessing. How many of you by witness can say, oh, God bless me. And the week after that, the devil came along and tried to take it away. Come on, somebody knows what I'm talking about. God is going to test you. He's going to move you through your life in that sequence of events. He's going to inaugurate you. He's going to bless you. And then he's going to try you. Come on, somebody help me. Because he wants to, he's not doing it to hurt you. He's doing it to solidify what he's planted in your life. But Jesus, let me get back on track. Jesus in John chapter 10 is dealing with his last public discourse. 
at least in the book of John. And he's looking at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the group of people that have surrounded him. And the circumstances surround John chapter 9 where he's just healed a blind man that was blind from his birth. And most of you know the story. You can read it in John chapter 9. I won't go all the way through it. But in essence, the man born blind is healed by Christ. He's then interrogated by the religious authorities of his day and said, How did you come to the place where you could see? He said, A man named Jesus. A man named Jesus. You got a problem tonight? I know the answer. A man named Jesus. You got a serious situation tonight? I've got the answer. A man named Jesus. You've got an impossibility or an improbability that you're facing. I know the answer. A man named Jesus. And this blind man, born blind from his birth, says, I met a man named Jesus who, who, who put mud on my eye and sent me to the pool of Siloam to wash it off. And then I became a seeing individual. He's healed me. And the response of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the shepherds, the religious authorities of that day were, well, he can't be of God. He operated on the Sabbath. Ding, 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 ding. They validated that it was the man that was born blind. They talked to his parents. They talked to those that knew him. They validated that he was blind. So ignoring the miracle because they didn't want to admit who Jesus said he was, he's got to be a sinner because he operated on the Sabbath. He didn't do it in my church. He didn't use my formula. So he can't be anybody important. The Bible said in John 9 that after they excommunicated the man, because he looked at him, he says, look, I don't know any theology. I haven't been to school. I can't even read and write. I've not been able to see to read and write. But I want you to know in my simplistic mindset, if this man wasn't from God, he couldn't do anything. And it's never, it's never, it's never happened before that a man born blind was ever healed and made to see. Now, I don't know much and I don't understand theology, but I know this, that that Man, Jesus, caused me to be able to see. All I know is that I was blind. Now all I know is that I was blind. All I know is that I was lost and life was futile and everything was empty and darkness was upon the face of my life. And a man named Jesus... And it in, and now I can see. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I think you'll have to excuse me as I lay aside your religious trapping and your religious talk. And I think that I'm going to run over here and just embrace this man called Jesus. Bye. Hey. And they gave him the left foot of fellowship. Yeah. Religion will always give you the left foot of fellowship when you say, I don't want your rules, I just want Jesus. Religion will always throw you out of their warm environs when you say, I don't think I agree with your thought processes, I just want Jesus. If you're hungry for Jesus, you won't find him on the inside of the theological formulations of denominations and interdenominational church structure. You'll find him wherever there's a heart that's hungry. You'll find him wherever there's a need of mankind. Wherever man is oppressed, wherever man is pushed down, wherever man is, uh, is, is realizing and hurting and experiencing the effects of the fall that's where you're gonna find Jesus and they kicked him out and you know what I don't think it bothered him I don't think think he worried about I don't think he cried on the way home but there he was healed changed delivered and religion wouldn't receive him 
But the Bible says in John chapter 9, when Jesus heard that they cast him out, he went and found him. <laughs> says he went and found him. Let me tell you, if religion has kicked you out because you've decided you were going to follow that blind man healer, that leper cleansing man from Galilee. Here's what I can tell you. Religion won't follow you. And men of religion won't follow you. But when religion kicks you out, Jesus is going to come looking you up. I said, Jesus is going to come looking you up. I said, Jesus is going to come looking you up. Because he's finally found somebody that's not trapped in the environs and the rules and regulations of theological denominational thought. He's found somebody that just wants whatever God has to offer. And Jesus comes to the man that's born blind. And he says this. Look at it so you, you can see it. Chapter 9 and verse 35. Jesus heard that they cast him out. When he found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Blind man had a simple answer. Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said, you have seen him, and it is he that talks with you. Sir, you are looking at the Son of God. Sir, man born blind now being able to see your eyes. One of the first things that it has ever been able to see is the living, breathing Son of the living God who was born of a virgin, lived a sinless, perfect life. Some people have seen many beautiful wonders in the seven majestic wonders of the world, but this blind man saw the most wonderful. This blind man saw the most precious thing, and it wasn't a flower. It was it wasn't a tree. It wasn't the wonder of nature. But it was the wondrous shepherd of Israel. It was the son of the living God. And you can't walk away from that scripture and say, well, Jesus never said he was the son of God. He said it right there. Clearly. Plainly. I'm, I'm, I'm he. The one you're looking at. Glory to God. The one you're looking at. I am he. I'm the one. Well, wouldn't you know it, a bunch of religious folk following Jesus around, they heard him too. <laughs> Blind man said, by the way, I believe. Jesus said, for judgment I'm come into this world that they which see not might see. And they that see might be made blind. So if you think you see... Take heed. If everything is clear and you don't have any corners or pockets of blindness, take heed. Perhaps there's a little something that you might need yet to see. Perhaps there's something yet that God wants to disclose to you. Perhaps there's something yet that God wants to impart to you. But your self-sufficiency blinds you to your need. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? We're the top banana, the hot dog, the enchilada. I mean, just look us up in the world of religion. We're on the front page of all the charismatic magazines. The great Christian networks are espousing our names. Are we blind? Man doesn't think we're blind. Men really like us. No, they didn't. Men were afraid of them. Are we blind also? And Jesus said, since you think you're not blind, you're dead blind. And I'm paraphrasing it. You think you're not blind, your sin remains. See, it's only those that recognize they can't see without Jesus that Jesus works for. It's only those that admit, I don't have it all together, that Jesus will work. And God said in the, in the book of James, I'll give my grace to the humble, but I'll resist the proud. Are we blind also? You can just hear the cynicism and the sneer of religion and the hatred of Jesus in the comment. Are we blind also? If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see therefore your sin remaineth. 
Then he goes right into his dissertation of John chapter 10. I say that simply because verily, verily, never in the entrances of Jesus' dissertations begins a dissertation. It actually incorporates that which followed previously. And so Jesus, in this atmosphere, decides to see or prove as to whether or not the men he's talking to are blind. He says, all right, I got to tell you something, fellas. Let's see whether you're blind or not. I say unto you that he that entereth not by the door into the sheep, uh, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he porteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of the strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them. Now, a parable always has, unlike an allegory, one single main emphasis. Instead of drawing out little single passages or little single points, a parable has one main passage. Jesus gives the parable that gives the scenario of a sheep coat or a sheep fold. Sheep coat, C-O-T-E. In the Palestinian arena, in the Syrian arena, there was oftentimes a fold that kept the sheep. It was enclosed. If this octagon was a fold or a sheep coat, there would be one entrance, let's say it's right here. And a wall, or perhaps the side of a house and a wall, would protect what was inside that enclosure. On top of the wall would be brambles and brushes and thorns placed, much like razor wire, around that enclosure so that anybody attempting to go over the wall would secure hurt for themselves. At night, the sheep would be brought from the pasture and brought into the fold and placed in the inward environs of this protective sheepfold. There would be one door and one door alone. The shepherd would drop his sheep off in the evening and there would be a porter who, knowing the shepherd personally, would close the door or operate and stand as the door himself. He knew who the shepherd was. And when the shepherd would come for his sheep in the morning, the porter would open the door. But the porter didn't open the door for anyone. He only opened the door for one. And this is Jesus' point. I'm the only one that qualifies as the shepherd. I'm the only one that the porter will open to. Hey, religious folk, you say you're not blind? Hear this. I'm the only one that's qualified to enter into the sheepfold and take out the sheep and lead them into water. Lead them into the green pastures. I'm the only one. The porter recognizes my voice and I walk forward and my sheep, because I'm their shepherd and we have a personal relationship, they know my voice. Do you know who I am? Do you see that I am the only one qualified? Do you understand that I am he whom God provided? Do you understand that I'm the one that God prophesied about in in, in Psalms and in Psalm 80 and in Ezekiel and in Isaiah 40? Do you understand? You should understand. You're the leaders of Israel. Do you understand that I'm the qualified, the only qualified one to stand as shepherd of the flock of God? They understood not. All right? They don't understand. Jesus says, well, let's talk some more. Since you didn't understand that, let me get a little clearer. Let me proclaim something to you. Get this. (laughs) Not too hard for you to understand? A little difficult? Make your head swim? Get you a little blurry? Here's something really simple. I am the door. How about that? Easier for you? Catch on, fellas. Make it more simple. I know that you're theologically correct and religiously correct in all that you do. You dress right. You try to act right, at least in public. But do you get this one? I am the door. 
My Lord, people, Jesus was a man. Let me tell you, what a man. He was a man that would stand up in the face of people that hated him and proclaim exactly the word of God. He stood up in the midst of this religious, awful, hating bunch and said, I want you to know who I am. I am the light of the world. I want you to know if you don't understand that. I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. What? You don't understand that? Let me tell you something, Mr. Religion. I am the door. No way else in. No way else out. You want to know God? You got to come through me. What a man. 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 man. I follow the man. I follow the man. I follow the man. The Lord Jesus. What a man. My Lord. They never received him. And so he turned to his disciples and he said, in fact, in the end of this discourse, he'd say, before Abraham was, just so you get it, I am. Martha got upset. Lazarus was dead. He tries to comfort her. Martha, don't you understand who I am? I am the way. No, I am the resurrection and the life. If a man were dead, yet shall he live. Jesus said it about himself. What a man. Who else can say it? What a man. Who else can proclaim it? What a man. Jesus proclaimed it. He looked at Philip and he said, Philip, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. What a man. What a man! What a man! He was the light of the world. He was the bread of life. He was the way, the truth, and the life. He was the resurrection and the life. He is the door. Hallelujah! He's the good shepherd. He's the true vine. He is the I am that I am. And he came down here and stood on two legs and stared religion in the eye and said, I am. And if you don't accept me, there's no other way in. I am. I'm the door of the sheep. He says in verses 7 through 10, I'm the door of the sheep. You didn't get the whole sheep thing that I could, I'm the only shepherd that could possibly be. Let's make it more simple. I'm the door. I'm not the porter. I'm the door. One way. One way. One way. Man, you know, people that didn't like Jesus didn't like to hear that. And people that don't like Jesus today still don't like to hear that. The door. The door definite article, specific, the door, no other door, the door. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. And he's not talking about those in the past. He uses the present tense are. The first thing the shepherd would do would come to the sheepfold in the morning and stand outside of the sheepfold and he would give a specific cry or a specific call. Something that not just the sound of the voice, but the call would be unique. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There's coming a day. (laughs) In the not too distant future. Where the son of God. Is going to call. With a shout. And every sheep. That know the sound of his voice. Whether they be dead or alive. Listen, this call can go beyond the confines of the grave. A body withered down to nothing but dust and a bony remnant laying there in a coffin somewhere or in the murky depths of the sea when the shepherd gives the call. When the shepherd steps out on the portals of glory and shouts with a great shout and the trump of God sounds, every sheep that knows the shepherd's voice is coming from the grave and we that are alive and remain will be joined together with our shepherd. He said, but if they came before me, if they tried to get to the enclosure before I did, (laughs) 
They're thieves and robbers. They're not going through me. I'm the person. I'm the door. Every other one is a thief. They've got to, since they reject the door, try to climb the wall to get to the sheep. Reject the door, the person. Reject the door, the person. Reject the door, the person. You are a robber trying to get to that which doesn't belong to you for your own purpose. And your purpose will be to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He's the door. They're still looking at him with their heads cocked and their religious brains going knockity, 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 knockity. Because that's what religious brains do. Knockity, 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 knockity. <laughs> says, don't understand that? Verse 11. I am. I am the good shepherd who gives his life, who lays down his life for the sheep. I am the door. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life. Why the two together? As the door, he stands as the only person that can bring about the needs and meet the needs for the sheep. But as the good shepherd, he declares his work, which is his crucifixion. I lay down my life. I'm going to tell you now about the good shepherd. You want to know the main attribute of the good shepherd? He's going to lay down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I'm the door. I'm the person. I am the good shepherd. I'll do the work necessary. Again, it's Christ, the person, and Christ crucified, the good shepherd. Christ, the person, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. Paul said, if you want your faith to stand in the power of God, you've got to embrace Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus comes along and says, I'm the door. I'm the person. And if you're going to have to accept that, you're also going to have to recognize that I'm the good shepherd because I've laid down my life. I've laid down my life. You want to find the good shepherd? You've got to find the one who laid down his life. And he was also the one that had the power to pick it up again. Lay it down, pick it up. Lay it down, pick it up. I'll follow any man that can match that. I said, I'll follow any man that can match that. Lay it down and pick it up. Honey, you might be able to lay it down, but only the good shepherd had the power to pick it back up again. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. Romans 5, 7 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man would some even dare to die. You want to know how much God loves you? Think of what it would mean to lay down your life for something you believed or for somebody else. And that's really what Romans 5 and 7 talks about. With difficulty, scarcely, you might die for a righteous man, somebody innocent, somebody just. Think of it. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. With great difficulty would you maybe perhaps offer your life for someone that's innocent and just. I love you. But if I've got to lay down my life for you, you better invest in some plot ground. Oh, come on, don't get religious on me. I love you, but I'm not sure unless the grace of God would help me that I would be willing to lay down my life for you. Oh, you all look at me like, yeah, sure, no problem. I'd lay it down in a heartbeat. Just ask me, Brother Lars. Okay, good. <laughs> Scarcely, the Holy Ghost said, with difficulty, it would be greatly difficult for you to offer your life even for one that was just and innocent. For a child, maybe. For a man that was innocent of the charge he was facing and you knew it, it would still be difficult. Or possibly, peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die, the scripture says. Possibly for an excellent man, a beloved man, somebody you admired, perhaps. You would give your life for him or for her. But Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I'll lay down my life for you. And you're not good. 
And you're not righteous. And you're not holy. You're not my equal. You're not above me. The truth is, I'm the only perfect one. I'm the only holy one. But God took the good shepherd who was holy, perfect, and righteous and looked at us who would scarcely die for a just man and might peradventure possibly die for a one that we love and commended his love towards us while we were yet sinners. No redeeming qualities. God didn't save you because of how wonderful you were. He saved you because you needed saving. He saved you because you needed saving. And he sent a good shepherd. Now I've got to deal with this next area and I'll try to do it quickly. Jesus talks about in this area not just the qualities of the good shepherd, which was that he would lay down his life. He would get to know the sheep personally and interact with them. Not only that, they would come to know him and he would introduce them to the father as the good shepherd. But there's another man Actually, two men pointed out here. The hireling. Now, the hireling, you've got to understand, was not an, in, the, in the sense in which it was written, it becomes negative, but the hireling is just a hired hand. He's not the owner of the sheep. He's just somebody hired to watch over the sheep. Perhaps an owner would have too many folds, too many sheep to congregate all in one place and so he could only be in one place at one time so he would hire a man it would literally indicates a wage earner there's nothing wrong with being a wage earner but the problem with the hireling is that he had no personal attachment to the sheep and if he happened to see a wolf coming a wolf would come against a flock to steal to kill to destroy in order to protect his own self, he would run. It's not my sheep. <laughs> they don't pay me enough for this. I mean, self-sacrifice, they don't pay me enough for this. I'm out of here. This is my responsibility, not my job. That's the attitude of the hireling. Wait a minute. What I've been getting is great. I love the pay, but if I've got to face a wolf, I think I'm going somewhere else. If I've got to endanger myself, if I've got, I mean, I thought that I was just going to gather in from the sheep, you know, that, that because of them I would have a livelihood. And the hireling in and of himself just doesn't care of the sheep. And so when he sees the wolf, he flees, and the wolf is able then to come in to the unguarded animal and rip up the ones he wants. And as he's ripping up one or two, the rest scatter to be lost and hurt, hungry, thirsty, dying, uncared for. He's a hireling. Interestingly enough, in the Word of God, the word that describes the wolf in the Greek is lukos, transliterated L-U-K-O-S, lukos. It's used six times in five verses in the New Testament. And every time, it doesn't speak of a natural wolf, it speaks of a man. The wolf is a man. The wolf is not a natural animal, it's a man. Jesus is not describing to the people that are listening just a natural event, even though that is natural. For instance, let me read this to you, Matthew 7 and 15, Beware of false prophets! which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. A man. Matthew 10 and 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Luke chapter 10 and verse 3, Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves speaking to his disciples, and last of all, the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 30. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves 
savage wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Now, no man alive today is the great shepherd. There's only one. All the rest that are in leadership in the church are either under shepherds, hirelings, or wolves. Under shepherds, they point you to the great shepherd. They say, I'm not the one that's going to lead you out and cause you to relax by the streams and nurture yourself on the green grass, but I'm going to point you to one who you need to learn, who you need to acquaint yourself with, who you need to become acquainted with so you hear his voice because I don't want you to follow me. I want you to follow the good shepherd. Learn his voice. And if we're an under-shepherd, If we're properly an under-shepherd, we'll preach that the shepherd is the door. And that he laid down his life for the sheep. I said we'll preach that he's the door. And that he's the one that laid down his life for the sheep. We'll preach Christ and him crucified. The same thing the good shepherd said about himself. I am to proclaim to others about him that you might not worship me, but that you might worship him. Others are hirelings in the church. They'll stay as long as it's profitable for them. God, I'll, I'll go anywhere as long as there's a good salary and a parsonage and a car's included. I have several weeks vacation. <laughs> Had one brother in Gonzales one time tell me uh, we were out in a prison meeting. and he, In fact, we were waiting to go see prisoners outside at Hunt. And there's usually a wait as you wait the van. He, Introduced himself to me and he said, you know, we were a little church outside of Gonzales and we applied for the pastorship. You know, we, we lost our pastor. We started looking for other pastors. And you don't know, Brother Larson, the number of calls that we got from men that said, oh, God's leading me to your church. I feel God is leading me to be involved with the church there. By the way, how much does it pay? God's called you, and you ever ask, how much does it pay as a prerequisite to your going? You're a hireling. You're a hireling. It's not wrong to know what God is going to bless you with. It's not wrong to know what to expect. I understand that you have needs, but if the motivation of your heart is what can the sheep provide for me, you're a hireling, and the moment that what they provide for you is taken away, you'll run and leave them destroyed. Secondly, a hireling will not face a wolf. And a wolf is not a wolf. A wolf is a man. You better find you a shepherd. That when a wolf comes to attack the flock, doesn't run away. But will stand up and tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that is a wolf. And some of the sheep aren't going to believe him. Because they like the wolf. And the wolf is dressed up in sheep's clothing. And is coming in to destroy and tear and steal and kill and destroy. And the true under shepherd stands up and says, that's a wolf. And if it costs me everything, I'm going to say that's a wolf. And you're not getting in to touch the ones God's given to me. And if you're not willing, listen to me, preacher, if you're not willing to address the wolf for what he is in the false doctrine that he's teaching and the false doctrine that he's preaching, you don't deserve to be an under-shepherd and you have revealed yourself as a hireling addressing just what is good for you and the reason you don't say anything and the reason you don't proclaim what you're supposed to proclaim to protect the sheep is because you're worried of what the rest of the church is going to think about you and you are a hireling. Get out of the pulpit. 
go plumb, dig ditches. You're not willing to face a wolf. You're not an under shepherd. You ought to thank God. I said, come on, somebody help me here. You ought to thank God. When there's an under shepherd that'll stand up and say, that's a wolf. Because he's not doing it for the applause of the church, because the church isn't going to applaud him. But he does it because he loves the sheep, and he's not going to allow the wolf to destroy what God has put together as a flock. The under shepherd, it's not a hireling, he's not a wolf will stand up and point the sheep to the one, the great shepherd, who is the door, who is the way, the truth, the life, the bread of life, the light of the world, the resurrection, the life. You'll say, follow him. Follow him. Learn his voice. Follow him. God said in Ezekiel, Woe to the shepherds who fail to feed the flock. And in Jeremiah he promised, I will raise up shepherds who with my heart will pastor the flock of God. And if that's your pastor, if that's your shepherd, if that's the person you're sitting under, when the wolf comes, they'll say something to you. They'll point it out, say that's not safe. They won't try to lord it over you. They won't try to have dominion over you. They're not babysitters. They're men and women of God who will say, that's a wolf, watch out. And they'll point you to the shepherd who can lead you into that which is needful. Singers, musicians, make your way back. Let me ask you tonight as we finish this service, close it out. You have a responsibility as a believer. And you're following a voice. You're following a voice tonight. Because God has set it up in the church that the church is built through vocal ministries. It's not built any other way but through the preaching of the word. Through the preaching of the Bible. Not everybody's pointing you to Christ and Him crucified. Not everybody's pointing to the cross as the effectual atonement that God provided. And I've got to ask you tonight, what are you listening to? Are you hearing the voice of the Good Shepherd? Are you following Him to the green pastures and the still waters. He'll lead you through the valley, David, of the shadow of death. He'll anoint you and set a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Are you following him? Have you found yourself with a hireling who won't proclaim anything to you because he's afraid you'll take your tithe and your offering and run away? Have you been fellowshipping with the wolf who's took everything from you, caused you pain, tore you, and now you're bleeding and hurt? I got good news for you tonight. The good shepherd is still available. Would you stand with me? If this podcast has been a blessing to you and you would like to contribute to this ministry, feel free to contact us at 1-800-288-8350 or you can go to our website at www.jsm.org. We love you. God bless you.